Well, hello everyone. I think we will begin now. Uh, welcome to our first day of Biodiversity and Cities, an event that is part of the series People, Prosperity and the Planet by the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. I am Marcela Angel, Research Associate at the MIT ESI, and I will be your moderator for today's session. The ESI is an organization at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a mandate to enlist and convene the faculty, students, and research staff on environmental challenges. In today's session, we will discuss the urban science, policy, and design frameworks that support biodiversity conservation in cities. And tomorrow's session will be focused on a series of case studies and efforts from developing countries that showcase the bio biodiversity conservation pathways enabled by cities with a focus on the challenges and opportunities for the global south. But before we begin, I would like to thank to our partners, the MIT Sloan Latin American Office and the Humboldt Institute of Colombia, who have been working closely with us to organize this event. You can find more about the ESI and our partners in these websites. I also want to point out that we will have simultaneous translation to Spanish. Y para quienes quieren escuchar este evento en español, tenemos la opción simultánea que pueden activar dando clic al icono del globo de interpretación que está ubicado en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom, como pueden ver en la diapositiva. So today we have an extraordinary panel. Thank you to all the panelists for joining us. And we will be focusing on the interconnected issues of biodiversity conservation and urban development. On the one side, biodiversity losses are reaching critical levels. Over 1 million species are threatened with extinction this century, and extinction rates are at least 1,000 times the natural rate. It is clear that human extraction and consumption of material resources has profound impacts on the ecologies at global scale. It has also become evident that setting aside protected areas for conservation has been too slow and will not be enough to stop human-induced biodiversity loss and the current extinction rates. On the other side, we are living in an urban age and cities concentrate more than half of global greenhouse gas emissions, drive the extraction of resources far beyond their limits, but also act as concentrators of human activities and global decision-making power. So as urban areas continue to expand around the globe, and particularly in the global south and in close proximity to biodiversity hotspots, there is a need to address biodiversity conservation considering the multiple roles and capacities of cities. This event brings together diverse perspectives on this issue to look at the challenges and opportunities for cities to play a significant role in biodiversity conservation. Each of the speakers will provide a perspective from a different angle including the global scale, the city level strategies, the socioeconomic models, and the roles of citizens and environmental stewards. Now to finalize just some logistics and reminders. In the first part of this session, we will have short presentations from our five speakers, and then we will have a Q&A session. The speakers will be also addressing questions from the audience in the chat. So please use the Q&A feature to submit questions and also specify who your question is for. We will be giving brief introductions, but we will be posting the speakers bios in the chat for everyone to read more about our speakers. And again, we will have simultaneous translation. So, acuérdense, tenemos traducción simultánea para quienes quieren oír este evento en español. Let me now welcome Professor John Fernandez. Professor of Architecture, Director of the Urban Metabolism Group, and Director of the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela. I'm going to share my slides and get to... Okay, can you see my slides? Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, thank you for the introduction to the event. I'm very excited about this. I'm, I'm thrilled to be with you. I only have nine minutes, so I'm gonna just dive into it. Uh, I wanna start 
by relating an experience I had in Colombia now about two years ago. I felt firsthand the footprint of the global economy in a biodiversity hotspot in a small town in Southern Colombia. That one, one evening I noticed that the sky was ever so slightly glowing in a number of different directions. And I realized then that this was the natural gas flaring of, flaring of methane at the, at the site of oil wells deep in the jungle. Here was the direct footprint of the global energy market in one of the most biodiverse places on earth. Cities account for approximately 60 to 70% of global energy consumption and directly and indirectly drive the emissions of about three quarters of greenhouse gas, global greenhouse gas emissions. Urban economies now dominate the global economy and as a result, global extraction, production and consumption of energy and materials. Today, the combined economic output of the world's 20 largest cities is on par with the entire US economy. And urban economies in total account for the majority of food, energy, and water consumption on Earth. And today's world is also urban in population. Most people live and work in cities. This is as of 2008. But the nature of that urbanization is continuing to change dramatically. In 1950, the world's largest cities were in West, Western Europe, Canada, the United States, and Japan. And today, the largest cities, mega cities of 10 million or more, are in Indonesia, Japan, India, Korea, China, and Brazil. In the coming decades of the first half of this century, the global urban population will double, with 90% of that growth occurring in cities in developing regions of the world. Projections to, two, to 2100, and the image there on the right, you can see some of the, the population projection numbers for a variety of cities, suggest that the three largest cities, five of the top 10 and 13 of the top 20 will be African cities. By 2050, Nigeria's total population will surpass that of the United States. And by 2100, it may exceed that of China. Lagos, Nigeria is predicted to be the world's most populous city by 2100 with approximately 88 million residents within a country upwards of 900 million. In the year 2100, as much as 80 to 90% of the world's population may be living in cities with between 15 and 23% living in the 100 largest cities, mostly in Africa and Asia. And if you superimpose onto this map, a rough map of the biodiversity hotspots, you will see immediately the challenges that we are facing, especially with urbanization in the global south. So the primary purpose of my presentation these few minutes is to highlight two interconnected but distinct set of issues. The first is the stress that's placed on biodiversity by the global urban economy. And the second is the stress as a result of the co-location of urban growth with biodiversity hotspots in Africa, Asia, as well as India, Latin America, and Central Asia and other places. So I offer you this diagram, this abstract diagram um, that provides a schematic of the two major zones for us to consider, the urban land area on the left and then the non-urban area. Um, on the circle on the right. And the non-urban area includes the oceans. Within these two areas are three zones that have been receiving the greatest amount of attention from different research communities on the issue of biodiversity in cities. And they're numbered here. So number one is the actual urban space itself. And I think a good amount of the, what we will be talking about in this uh, event has to do with that. The city, the biodiversity within the city. The second is the urban perimeter. And sometimes this is referred to as a peri-urban zone, also known in some fields as the hinterland. And that this zone can either be a, a thin 
uh, ribbon around the city, or it can be as large as the entire region in which the city sits. And then the third is, I've already mentioned, the non-urban space, which of course is everything else. Each of these three zones holds the potential also for a biodiversity hotspot, which is in the darker green. The fields that are addressing the urban land area are fields like urban ecology, urban and regional planning, urban metabolism, the field that I uh, work in, architecture, and many, many others. The list is very, very long. The fields that are focused on the non-urban area are things like fields like socio-metabolic regime re research, economy-wide material flow analysis, ecology generally, and then many, many other fields. Um, so let's talk about the first, just one instance of concern for biodiversity within and around the city. And that is the growth in the area of cities themselves. This poses challenges. Projections on the increase range pretty widely, but all scenarios are predicting significant land area increases. The scenarios correspond to five, from this paper, five shared socioeconomic pathways, which show the amount of urban land on earth by 2100 could range from about 1.1 million to 3.6 million kilometers squared across the five scenarios. This is roughly 1.8, 1.8 to 5.9 times the global total urban area of about 0.6 million kilometers squared in the year 2000. So this is an important consideration and it's just one of many, but it's one issue that I wanna put on the table. Despite the relatively small amount of total global land area, because cities are often occupying, and as I showed before, sometimes right in the middle of or adjacent to some of the most productive land and most biodiverse land on earth. Now, let me talk, uh, not a depth, there we go. And then on the second set of issues, the, the stresses that cities impose on biodiversity by way of their material and energy demands, uh, let me offer this diagram shows the size of the material flows for the global economy. And today there's a lot of talk about circular economy and that being the pathway towards a sustainable future. So this diagram is from flows in 2005, but the flows haven't changed dramatically since then. And it shows that 44% of all processed materials were used to provide energy. So it's a linear throughput, 26 gigatons per year or 43% of all processed materials were added to stocks of buildings, infrastructure, and other goods with a lifetime longer than a year, essentially materials to make cities. The dominant linear throughput of material and additions to stock in the form of buildings, infrastructure, and cities is the primary reason the health of biodiversity and ecosystems is being stressed to the breaking point as almost all materials serving urban economies come from outside urban areas. And finally, this image makes clear the need to address the intensity of consumption of economies in the, the, in the developed world. This figure shows consumption-based CO2 emissions per capita as a proxy to make the point that a major challenge will be to find ways in which to lessen the extraction and export of materials from the global south to the richer north. This is one of the ways in which global biodiversity is affected by the continuing wealth creation of cities and especially those in the developed North. So with that, I hope this has been a useful, admittedly super quick synopsis of some of the range of issues related to cities and biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for showing us and for visualizing some of the invisible connections between cities and biodiversity. Now I would like to introduce our second speaker of the evening here in Cambridge, but morning in Australia. So thank you, Wendy, for being with us so early. Wendy Steele is Associate Professor in Sustainability and Urban Planning at the Center for Urban Research at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. And well, Wendy will share considerations from an urban geography and city planning perspective. Welcome, Wendy. You're on mute. 
Thank you, Marcella, and thank you, John. I'll just share my screen now. Can you see my screen, Marcella? Yeah. Great, terrific. Uh, look, first I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today on the Wurundjeri land, and I would like to pay my sincere respects to traditional custodians and elders past, present and future, and recognize that their lands have never been ceded, and I commit to learning on sacred country. So 2020 was the hottest year globally on record. During the Australian Black Summer, fire tornadoes howled through the day and night, the sky turned black, and with it the land, water and settlements were covered in a thick ash. People lost everything, including their lives, homes and businesses were destroyed, tens of millions of hectares of land were ravaged, and an estimated one billion native and domestic animals were burnt alive their charred remains scattered along the roads where some had desperately tried to seek refuge from the fire. Critically endangered species had their habitats even further destroyed or severely damaged due to these bushfires, placing their prospects for long-term survival at severe risk. This included unprecedented mass fish die-offs where um, heavy rain washed ash and charred debris into the rivers after the bushfires. Uh, causing thousands of dead rotting fish to be found along riverbanks, killed by the rapid drops of oxygen levels in the water as a result. The research shows that prolonged exposure to bushfire smoke increases the risk of respiratory illness, smoke-induced stroke and heart attack, particularly for those most vulnerable, such as the elderly. Pregnant women were warned of the dangers of an early miscarriage due to hazardous smoke inhalation. Trapped in an apartment or house at the end of a cul-de-sac surrounded by smoke-filled air, people and non-human species felt claustrophobic and vulnerable. There was nowhere to run, there was nowhere to hide, even in the urban heartlands of cities and urban regions. So, hmm. as a global community, we have a shared but differentiated responsibility for taking urgent action on climate change to protect the Earth's biodiversity. We have demonstrated that we have the capacity to generate large emissions. You can see in Australia, we're one of the largest culprits through our unsustainable cities and cycles of production and consumption, which includes, as John pointed out, energy use, transport and food choices that are contributing to global warming and causing fuel uh, climate fueled catastrophes and disasters. But we have yet to demonstrate that we can make the scale of changes required at the speed for humanity to continue to exist so that life and biodiversity, the biological variety and variability of life can survive, let alone thrive as we move forward. This is an image by internationally renowned New Zealand artist Anne Noble. She has developed a number of projects in recent years that are concerned with bees global species loss and the revitalization of human relationships to complex living systems. This is a series of black and white photographic portraits of dead bees. She magnifies the insects which are part of our daily life and she asks us to mourn and to feel for these non-human species whose futures like ours are very uncertain. That this is a warning of what we may lose and the yet to be feelings of grief and sadness that this will cause. So for this artist, the bee as a species indicator is a reminder of our collective part in the global crisis that we are facing. And it's also a warning, she says, that maybe what is happening to the bees is actually what's happening to ourselves and yet we do not see this. So part of addressing this challenge entails repurposing our current systems towards radically reducing our carbon footprint, but also critically to giving substance to notions such as equity and justice and our ethical attempts to craft the way we live. So how can we better shape the conditions of our cities within this context of climate change? What kind of urban futures should we be planning in order to support and sustain Earth's biodiversity? The idea of disrupted cities is that when infrastructure breaks down, our vulnerabilities and weaknesses are most clearly revealed, including the illusion of our own species cleverness and supremacy. This is a ruin, if you like, to the dreams of modernity, mobility and circulation that underpin these. It's this sense of crisis that when things break down, they become more visible. And this includes the complexity of urban life, 
and the interrelationships between her urban and natural life. And in doing so, we might be able to forge new ideas about what life might be. So the anthropause was a term coined by Christian Roots and colleagues published in Nature in 2020. They noticed that people were referring to the COVID lockdown period as the greatest pause in response to the unprecedented slowing down of human activity in the face of unfolding tragedy. This pause, they argued, has been extremely revealing of the nature and extent, particularly of human wildlife interactions and the interdependency between the two. So from bird watching, pet keeping, live stream, digital animal interactions, virtual gaming, there has been a, a lot more uh, differentiated engagement with nature, but also examples of amplified threat and disturbance, particularly to endangered species. Colleagues in geography at Cambridge and Oxford have argued for the need not just to emphasize the pause, but also the unpause. They draw on Arunda Dati Roy's claim that the pandemic is in fact a portal and that whilst a pause implies a looping back to the past, if we see the, the pandemic as a portal, then we can see the political potential for disruption, transition and transformation, an alternative future that is more regenerative departing from the old urbanization model. So responses to how we might deal with this range from speculative infrastructural architecture to socially equitable and biosensitive urban planning and design. Planet City, for example, is a provocation by Liam Young and colleagues for radically reversing planetary urbanization and sprawl. What they ask, if we undertake a complete planned retreat from our vast networks of cities that have swallowed up the globe and locate ourselves instead, collectively, all of us on earth into one hyper-dense metropolis that houses the entire planet. The ambition, and this is a speculative non-fiction ambition, is hyper-densification so that the rest of the planet can be a global wilderness. In Planet City, they imagine that climate change is no longer seen as a technological problem, but recognized as a deeply ideological one with roots in culture and politics. So the project raises some very confronting and provocative questions, such as what would we give up to save ourselves? And what would we relinquish to rewild the earth? So possibly the polar opposite of the planet city provocation are infrastructural and design initiatives, such as the newly completed Little Island in New York, which works across 132 tulip shaped pots rising out of the water and connected to piles in the river's bedrock. Nested in these pots is a maritime botanic garden, which features 35 species of trees, 65 species of shrubs, 300 varieties of grass, 66,000 bulbs, many of which have been selected specifically for their ability to attract birds and pollinators. The dream and the invitation is to be wild. The hope is that Little Island will reflect the broader biodiversity of the city. It's charming, but is it enough? So where Planet City envisage an island city surrounded by a world of wilderness, Little Island inverts this uh, and is surrounded by a world of urban infrastructure. So cities are often hotspots, as we know, for threatened species, but urban planning approaches typically consider biodiversity as a constraint, as a problem to be dealt with. Work by my colleagues at the Centre for Urban Research at RMIT University are proponents of what they describe as biodiversity sensitive urban design, which treats biodiversity as a gift, as an opportunity, as a valued resource to be preserved and built into the urban fabric by linking urban planning design to the basic needs and survival of native plants and animals. So this approach to design draws on ecological theory and understanding by applying five principles protect and create habitat, help species disperse, minimize anthropogenic threats, promote ecological processes and encourage positive human nature interactions. But it's this last point that is the rub because the anthropocentric city is founded on ontological binaries, humans versus non-humans, organic versus artificial, living versus non-living, wild versus tame. So at the center of this space is the human subject and all others are categorized in a hierarchy defined by how they, by their distance from the center. So we have domestic pets as closest to humans out to feral wildlife and then from living to inanimate objects. So there's a problematic conflation here of the non-human and the human as broad categories as if we are all the same, but not all humans are the same. 
and not all species are the same. So to imagine genuinely a post-anthropocentric city requires moving beyond the essentialism of human as the creator of enlightenment, the Cartesian citizen object to you know, the rights holder, the property owner. So these processes are not apolitical. In settler colonial countries like Australia, hugely consumptive emissions generating countries like Australia, this builds on the ongoing brutality of indigenous land, dispossession and displacement, which has never been ceded, reflecting more broadly, a critical crisis in urban production and consumption and redistribution. So a key task of critical engagement, genuine critical engagement with cities and, and urban infrastructure is the in the transition towards sustainability is, is how to chart the path, as David Harvey might describe, to alternative forms and points of societal transformation more broadly. So this would be a future where sacred birthing trees like the one you see in this image, such as those on Jawaran country in Australia, are not sacrificed and cut down for the sake of the building of a dual purpose highway. So new paradigms of social and ecological commons, such as Buen Vivir, are foremost a decolonial stance. They're a new set of ethics based on bio-civilization, how we might do things differently in cities. So this is more than a social or environmental movement, but new paradigms that we can learn from, new types of social and ecological commons for thinking and practicing alternative futures. The intention here is to repoliticize the role of cities and urban infrastructure and how this is linked to the politics of biodiversity. So this is not just recognition of vulnerability and interconnectedness, but also about the linkages between critical infrastructure, human and environmental systems integrity and equity within the context of settler colonial capitalist urbanization. And this is all set in the context of climate change. So finally, humans are very much a human centered story. And more specifically, they're a settler colonial story but in the mythology of modernism, the city was depicted as a place where nature had been tamed and domesticated into a physical environment for human habitation. But in the Anthropocene, cities are increasingly understood as interconnected, extremely vulnerable and major contributors to our planetary ecological and, bio and biodiversity crisis. Our futures are entangled. Our urban lives are mirrored in the lived experience of those around us, human and non-human and alternatives will be forged in, in, in navigating these encounters. So how can we tell the story of cities in ways that shape these encounters differently? How can we tell the story of our cities in ways that are far more sustainable than they currently are? And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy, for showing us the different linkages and then also the models that consider biodiversity as one of the main like the city models that rethink the city considering biodiversity as one of the main factors. Now I'll introduce our third speaker, Felipe Garcia. Felipe Garcia is the head of the Biodiversity Sciences Program at the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Biodiversity Research in Colombia. And Felipe will be presenting a socioeconomic perspective. Welcome, Felipe. You're in the... Ah, sorry. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. Are you seeing? Yes. The presentation? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Marcela. Um, I am going to start uh, first uh, giving a, a short introduction uh, about this, this uh, presentation. Is connected with a, a project that we are working between uh, the Humboldt Institute uh, as a National Institute for Biodiversity and the uh, Municipality of Bogota with one of the principal institutions, the Instituto para la Economía Social, that they are uh, in charge of different aspects uh, related with the uh, socioeconomical uh, issues, uh, including uh, the, the local markets in Bogota. So, and uh, first, I'm going to talk about, uh, a little bit about the bioeconomy strategy in Colombia. It's something that we are working with different institutions. This is uh, something that the Minister of Science is uh, leading, and we are participating in, in this strategy with all the biodiversity use strategy. So something that uh, we are trying to do with this is how to uh, visibilize all the uh, 
risk that Colombia has in, especially in, in, in plants. So Colombia uh, has uh, incredible numbers in biodiversity. So on one of the principal groups that we are leading is, uh, is plants. So we are the second country in world in, in species in plants. Uh, we have more than 27 species in plants uh, in, 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 in our country. So it's something that uh, has an incredible uh, possibility for the uh, communities in, in the field. So we are working really, really hard indeed. And um, all the researchers that we are doing in this uh, are connected with a strategy, national strategy of uh, uh, conservation of plants, uh, where we can see something that for us has been um, a number that we are documenting and cataloging in different ways. So, and where we can find that uh, Colombia has more than 6,000 uh, of uh, useful plants for different uses. But something that is uh, it's incredible is that uh, the most part of the useful plant is connected with the medicinal use. So, and, and that is something amazing because this is connected not only with uh, biodiversity uh, numbers in plants, but also with the cultural uh, uses. So you have the possibility to connect this with the different communities in the country and how the use of uh, those plants has a traditional knowledge. And we are something that we are documenting in, in, in different forms. And we have different uh, catalogs and uh, databases where we are documenting this. So, and as a part of that strategy and uh, the uh, alliance that we have with the municipality of uh, Bogota, uh, we, uh, we are working in a project, an, an amazing project, a research project, where we are working uh, in, in, in the city, in, the, in a strategy that the municipality has with the different local markets in the, in the, in the city, related especially with all uh, the possibility to sell, especially uh, uh, all the food that we are finding in those uh, uh, local markets. So, Bogota has in this moment 19 different markets uh, located in, in uh, around the, the city. Uh, Bogota uh, has um, 8 million people and, uh, and we are, uh, do, those uh, uh, 18 markets is, uh, are connected with uh, especially uh, to the possibility to connect uh, farmers uh, in the countryside with, with people uh, in, the, in the city. And it's something that uh, is, is really interesting. It is, this strategy is permitting uh, not only to to, um, uh, to organize of the production of the of the food around the markets, but also all an urbanistic, cultural, gastronomic, and cultural value. So this is something really interesting. Is a strategy that the municipality of Bogota started almost ten years ago. So and in this moment. Uh, there are incredible uh, results. So, but the, it's the, the work that we are doing with, with this is especially located in, in one uh, special place, is the San Per Mendoza. It's, it's a local market that uh, is an icon of useful plants. And, and that is something unique. This is, is something that uh, is the possibility to show how one place uh, has the possibility to work uh, uh, with a different, um, vendors, especially focused in, in plants. And in this moment, we have found, this is a project, a, a current project, where, and we have some numbers to show in this uh, presentation. So where we can find in this moment more than 380 useful plant species. So, and that is incredible because we can found that in, in this place, in the, in the um, uh, plants characterization, we have found uh, almost the half is a, a, a native species. So that, that is something really spectacular for us because it's the possibility to protect uh, in, the, uh, in the market those, those kind of species. But the other uh, number that is, is, is really special is the more than a half is for medicinal uses. So this uh, place, it has uh, the possibility uh, to, um, to connect the, the not of Bogota with different territories. So we are, uh, uh, we, we found that we have uh, species for different regions of Colombia, uh, especially the Han Indian region. So uh, it's uh, something for us is really special because it's uh, the possibility to protect the High Andean mountains also. 
and we, we have found uh, additionally the possibility to, to have there the vendors for different regions of Colombia. As a, as a local farmer, this is really incredible because uh, two days in a week, all the farmers come to the market and they sell in the night the products and they have the possibility to, to, to show the, the different species and they have a, had that activity for more than two decades. Uh, yeah, and they are working with a, a, a different uh, value change. And for us, one of the principal uh, aspects of this project is, okay, how, what, what is next with this? Is, is the possibility to work with an, uh, an innovation strategy from farm to table. So, and, and, the, and the farmer market is, is the hinge with the uh, rural areas and the urban areas. So we are working in a strategy with most the, the principal uh, uh, restaurant of Bogota, one an important restaurant, minimal, that they are trying to create new forms of to transform the products uh, in, the, in, the, in the farmer market. And, uh, in, in that sense, we are doing a selection of 22 species, and every uh, species is incredible the numbers behind in terms of the possibilities that they have for the different uses. So, and we are in this moment, so I am going to show you just one example of that possibility that we have. It is the poleo. The poleo is a one species that we are characterizing, and we have in this moment a, 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 um, a really well characterized value change about poleo. But the numbers about this are incredible, more, or more than two tons of uh, poleo are sold in the, in the farmer market uh, every month. And we uh, have had a characterization of the different stakeholders behind the. Uh, the poleo, just one species, and uh, we have found that the possibility that we have to increase the market in this are uh, enormous. So we are going to find that we are going to work with uh, for different value change, uh, gastronomy, we are going to work with uh, tourism, we are going to work with beverage, and we are going to work with uh, natural uses. So, and the idea is that uh, this project is uh, something that uh, for us, will permit us uh, to work in the recovery of the uh, market, especially for the uh, farmers uh, around the country. And this is just one example to show the possibilities that we have to, to, to uh, recover the economy in a post-COVID scenario. Uh, thank you, Marcela. Thank you, Felipe, for sharing with us the work that the Humboldt Institute is doing in Bogota and for showing how some of these are really opportunities for local uh, economic development. Now we will move on to our fourth speaker, Lorena Zarate. Lorena is co-coordinator of the Global Platform for the Right to the City, and she will offer thoughts on the issues of biodiversity and cities from a social justice lens. Welcome, Lorena. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcela. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to be with you today. It's, it's a pleasure, it's an honor for me to have this opportunity to share, I think, this very important discussion and I'm looking forward to continue this debate and in the months uh, to come. So I'm going to share my screen um, with a few slides too. Um, can you see that? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, um, basically, I'm, I'm working right now with a global platform with the right to the city um, and prior to that for several years um, with the Habitat International Coalition and, and so the things I'm going to present that are not really my ideas, uh, uh, for sure a uh, result of collective work and these platforms and, and coalitions are actually spaces for learning and, and collective action of different groups, including uh, grassroots, uh, social movements, NGOs, and also academics. And in particular in the global platform, uh, strong collaboration with local authorities, with networks, international networks of local authorities and municipalities. So the first thing is being, being organizations advocating for the right to housing and the right to the city. I think it's very, very important to start with this 
with this clarification. When we say we want right to housing and right to the city, we are not saying we want uh, more construction necessarily. And cer certainly we don't want the same construction that we are we're having right now. Um, so we are questioning actually, we, we want diversity, we want different options, uh, we want um, changing basically the principles behind how we build and, and create and transform our cities and territories. And in particular, questioning a couple of mantras that several organizations, including the UN agencies have been uh, talking about. Um, they're very dangerous and very problematic. One is this uh, kind of notion of inevitable urbanization so that we're moving toward that trends. And it seems that that trend is coming from uh, who knows where. <laughs> as if was, that was not connected with the with economic model and basically our patterns of production and consumption as the previous speakers were already mentioning. So this is very problematic and assuming that it, that is uh, inevitable and the only option possible. And the second one is that seeing cities as they call them engines, uh, engines of growth and by that meaning economic growth. Uh, and of course, that is also very problematic for the same reasons the previous speaker were already mentioning. So, of course, when we discuss prosperity and well-being, we're not talking about growth. Uh, and for sure, we're not talking about economic growth only. Uh, we know that that creates more consultation, not necessarily reduces inequality. And a pattern of, of um, crazy um, um, increment in the in the land mass of, of cities in the space the cities occupy as uh, as Professor Fernandez was mentioning at the beginning uh, at least during the past 30 years cities and urban areas have been growing worldwide uh, on average three times more than the population and in some places that can be even 10 times if not more so we have a problem there it's uh, another big problem it's not it's not correlated with the with the population growth uh, and behind that uh, is of course the, the point that land is a commodity and, and building uh, privatizing land and building houses uh, is basically in order to make money. So we need to really question this and this is at the core of our discourses from a human rights perspective. Um, and also questioning the notions that uh, the city, uh, that is actually the city what we see in the global south, uh, at least half those cities have been built by the people, nor by the state, not by the market. Um, and again, as Professor Fernando was mentioning at the beginning, this is the urban growth that we're going to see uh, in the decades to come. So um, of course we need to think how to, to change these patterns. And, and for us, part of the problem is how we name and how we frame these patterns and calling them informal settlements uh, arguing that they are dif something different and, and separated from what is called formal uh, is problematic. The formal is can be also informal. Uh, and actually there are two dynamics that are, that are totally uh, related. So basically pe people are you know, having to go and occupy places that in many cases are of course environmentally um, not only important but fragile. Um, it's because they don't have all the options, because uh, public sector and private sector are not, not um, offering all the options. So this is the way cities, these pictures are from Latin America, but uh, similar images in other places, in particular in the global south. And these are places made by the people over decades now, and they are communities, they are strong communities, and in many cases, we, we, we see that when these processes have been supported, recognize, visibilize, and support it, and not criminalize, uh, they can actually uh, incorporate a strong sustainable, sustainable approach to it. And including, for example, food production and urban agriculture or peri-urban agriculture, because many of these sites are actually located in that area and the peri-urban or, or rural urban uh, connection. So uh, urban agriculture is, is uh, not only necessary, but possible there, and trying to recuperate those uh, traditions and also um, doing visits, what we call in Spanish caravanas ambientales, so like environmental um, visits from these neighborhoods to the surrounding areas to actually meet with uh, communities, rural communities, indigenous communities, campesino communities, and discuss the problematic of the region as a, as a so social, uh, social natural metabolism and the things they need to know. And in that also 
um, as Professor Seal was mentioning, recuperating traditional knowledges uh, and indigenous people knowledges uh, from, from the area, both in terms of food production uh, and also medicinal plants, uh, but also in terms of building materials and building techniques, because that's another huge issue, uh, not just how cities are growing, but with, with kind, what kind of materials we're, we're uh, building the cities. So recuperating that is very important. This is one particular case uh, that is very challenging and very interesting. Um, it's kind of a pragmatic case in the sense that uh, represents um, um, similar cases in other places. Uh, this, in, this, this is located in, in Puerto Rico, uh, capital city in San Juan. Um, and again, it's a community built uh, over time, over decades, more than 50 years now, uh, in a very delicate area. There is a channel uh, connecting two important areas in, at the center of, of the capital city. Uh, and of course, part of the tension there is, um, you know, the need to recuperate um, the, the biodiverse area there and the role this uh, has to fulfill and also not to displace the population uh, have been living there for decades. So basically one of the solutions um, is to work with the community, of course, and incorporating this and having the communities as stewards of that recuperation, the recovery, and at the same time, creating a community land trust. So uh, that people can also be sure that they're not going to be displaced uh, from, from that area, but they need to work and to live there differently. And of course, linking this, the, this neighborhood with the rest of the city, because the responsibility is not just for this neighborhood, that actually we're talking about several neighborhoods and, and thousands of people living in this area. So um, quickly, a couple of slides with uh, some of the principles we have been working uh, with within the right to the city, and in particular three that are strongly related with, uh, with the natural environment uh, in cities and in surrounding areas. And, and one has to do, again, with uh, regarding the issue of you know, no, the, the need not to grow, not to keep growing our cities uh, and the urban sprawl, and to actually fulfill the social and environmental functions of buildings and, and things that we already have in cities. So we know that many cities, we have a lot of empty buildings, empty housing, for example, millions uh, in, in, in some regions, and but the cities keep, they keep growing, right? And we keep building new houses and new infrastructure. So how we look at that, how we look at what is already empty and, and we are not, it's not being used uh, and repurpose that as, as under the COVID crisis. We, we saw a lot in several places, of course, public spaces, and that includes natural areas within cities. And in particular, something that other speakers also mentioned, the need to rethink cities, not just beyond the municipality, beyond the administrative boundaries and thinking about regions and in particular eco regions. So how we rebuild that and those relationships. And we know that these are not just dreams or ideas, these are commitments and some of the international commitments uh, and agendas uh, trying to deal with this and how to balance the environmental issues, the social issues, the economic issues with some concrete goals. Uh, and we're trying to work with that, but in particular at the local level, because we, we see more opportunities there. And we know that more biodiverse cities are possible, but that will mean necessarily that they will need to be more socially, cultural, and economically diverse too. Um, and, and ethics of care at the, at the core of that, at the center of that, um, as others also mentioned. Thank you very much. And this is an announcement of something we, we are launching soon and, and happy to continue these conversations with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorena, for highlighting some of the shared goals of protecting the natural environment and the right to the city movement and the actions that advance both agendas simultaneously. So now we will move on to our last speaker, Nir Barak. Nir is lecturer in the Department of Politics and Government at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. Welcome, Nir. Can you hear me? Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm delighted to join uh, this uh, conversation from Israel where it's now uh, close to 1 a.m. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, Marcella, and Diana for uh, your kind invitation and to the colleagues uh, in the panel uh, for their fascinating uh, presentations. 
In my contribution, I want to bring a political perspective and to think about ecological citizenship or environmental activism from an urban perspective to a large extent, I'm uh, just uh, connecting to Marcella's uh, last points where the grand context is my interest in, this, in civic engagement in the efforts of transitioning cities into sustainable patterns. Of course, this interest is not just a personal one, but also a recognized uh, sustainable development goal. For example, under SDG and inseparable from the new urban agenda or Habitat 3, where it reads that the envisioned human settlements are participatory, promote civic engagement, the gender sense of belonging and ownership among all their inhabitants. Now, given this context, I want to share some thoughts and ideas from a research paper I published last year in a, the Environmental Politics Journal about ecological citizenship in cities, or what I term ecological citizenship. The model I want to present consists of the three uh, um, core components of political citizenship. That is participation, membership in a political community, and the rights entailed in virtue of membership. Now, what I want to examine is what happens to these three components once we bring in the city, and what happens when we think about this form of citizenship regarding ecological and environmental concerns. And I want to suggest three main arguments. The first is that, is that uh, the participation of urban environmental activists as ecological citizens exposes the interconnectedness of environmental agendas with social, political, cultural, and economic ones and that promoting environmental and ecological values like biodiversity is often a means, not an end, or only a secondary goal of ecological citizens. The second argument is that membership in the city makes a difference. There's something about being a Bostonian, a Bogotano, a New Yorker, a Berliner, a Tel Aviv, that is not just a symbolic identities. These urban political identities in impact who we are as citizens, how we understand political affairs and public policy, policy, and they foster different justifications and meanings for environmental civic engagement uh, and participation. And the third point relates to the rights component. And uh, the argument is that despite current notions of autonomous uh, city states, political participation in cities is not independent of the state, but dependent on the civil and political rights enshrined therein, thereby making this model politically hybrid, somewhere between the city and the state in terms of rights. Let's see how this abstraction plays out. A few summers ago, I was researching uh, urban environmental activism and participation, trying to understand uh, the institutional significance of the city and of the state, part of which entailed conducting interviews with urban environmental activists in Berlin, Hanover, Freiburg in Germany, and in Tel Aviv, Jaffa in Jerusalem in Israel. Overall, I interviewed uh, 45 people in 20 projects. One of these projects was an area in Berlin's uh, city center, originally slated to become a parking lot. The activists squatted the area and transformed it into an urban forest with a community food garden and cafe. You can see the before and after here, uh, where, in, where now uh, local citizens uh, relax, practice urban agriculture and meet. The activists noted various environmental concerns and motivations, such as fostering biodiversity, seeking to restore the natural processes in that area, like uh, the natural cleansing of air and water, making the area more sustainable and livable, promoting walkability, and making the district less car dependent. Less car dependent, dependent. While these ecological and environmental values were central to the project, they were conceived by the activists as secondary compared to other social and political goals. For example, they justified their opposition to the municipal plan by passionately declaring their right to the city. We have a political mission. For us, the main question was who decides how to use urban space. We have tailored the space according to the, to the real needs of the people who live here. They further justified their action as giving rise to civic empowerment and community building, using the space as an example and a platform for social learning. Their understanding is that the ecological and environmental values are important, but quite negligible in terms of their actual ecological impact, and they ascribe a higher value to increasing environmental literacy of other activists and on the civil education to take responsibility over their urban environments. Although various uh, similar projects pop up in various cities, they see this project as being totally Berliner. They connect themselves with the history and civic memory of the city, whereby uh, their successful struggle was viewed as building on the local legacy of resistance 
to urban development project characteristic of West Berlin in the 1960s. Moreover, when since this project is a real success, they were invited to replicate it in a different city in Poland, where it failed completely. When I asked them why, to their understanding, they said because they bought a Berliner state of mind to a place it does not belong. Now, when I inquired more deeply into their oppositional stance vis-a-vis -vis the municipality, okay, rejecting municipal policies at municipal plan, uh, uh, Sebastian, is, it's a pseudonym of one of my interviewees, said, we negotiate with the municipality because they always want to close us down. And there's always the danger of privatization, which is what the municipality really wants to do. And then he said, my actions are legitimate because I'm a citizen, I have rights. When I probed deeper, the rights Sebastian was uh, uh, referred to were his civil and political rights as secured by the German federal constitution and not the city of Berlin. Now, different projects play out differently in different cities. Th these are some of the, uh, some photos from project I, uh, I worked on for this paper, but the overall dynamic is similar. Participation is intertwined with ecological goals along with political and social ones. Similar projects in different cities receive completely different meanings and justifications, and all activists recognize that the civil and political rights secured by the state condition their activism. To say this very simply, opposition or reinforcement of municipal policies, the practice of our right uh, to the city through participatory me methods, such as a uh, direct action, demonstrating, rallying, demanding referenda, are contingent upon the civil and political rights, such as the right to liberty, freedom of thought, speech, association, and peaceful assembly, which only a sovereign power can safeguard. Now, let's take a step back uh, to think about the theoretical uh, underpinnings of all this. The notion of ecological citizenship builds on the understanding that governments alone cannot meet the goals of sustainable development without civic participation. The notion of citizenship entails that each of us, in addition to our national or urban citizenships, are also citizens of the environment, of the ecosystem, or of the climate. The appeal to the notion, to the notion of citizenship is intended to raise environmental awareness and to emphasize our rights and duties toward the environment, the climate, and nature in general. And these rights and duties are manifested in our quotidian everyday actions, starting from very small household practices, moving toward changing our consumption habits, our transportation preferences, and the like. In short, this idea overall is attuned to achieving green goals through the prism of citizenship. Now, a bit of a critical take on all this, which is all nice and well. However, for me, as a political scientist and theorist, thinking about citizen citizenship without direct reference to social and political institution is problemat problematic and not fully coherent. What does it mean to be uh, a citizen of an ecosystem? What are the rights that are entailed? Who secures? these rights, etc. We can talk about ecological selfhood or personal commitments to the environment, but when we disconnect citizenship from institution, from institutions, we also disengage from the types of questions that Marcella just raised, just raised, question of gender, racial and ethnic inequalities, questions of environmental justice, or from civic life in general. Now, when we do think about citizenship politically or vis-a-vis uh, -vis political institution, it is usually about national or global citizenships. However, uh, as John emphasized, as global urbanization increases, our cities, municipal governments, and urban identities are becoming more and more significant in our daily lives. Oops, sorry for this. Sometimes when we think about ecological citizenship, we, uh, we term it local citizenship not national, but not urban. Uh, but the idea of the local is deceptive because the uh, local can be an allotment garden, it could be a building, a neighborhood, or a bioregion. Who are or what is the institution underlying the, uh, this notion of localism? It is completely unclear. Occasionally, the idea of ecological citizenship is thought of in relation to the built environment as distinct from the wilderness or non-urban uh, open spaces or the semi-urban uh, uh, areas. Now, being a built environment is one characteristic of a city, but it does not exist its primary essence as a distinct social and political space. And nowadays, I think it would be more precise to think of cities as semi-autonomous polities, distinct from the state, and one from another. 
this idea shares an affinity with a paper recently published by John and Marcella, our moderator for this session in the journal Sustainability, which I highly recommend. All this is to say, what I'm suggesting is that thinking about ecological citizenship or environmental activism from an urban perspective is most coherent, not by giving some kind of primacy to the ecological goals, but uh, uh, thinking about its nexus with urban citizenship or simply citizenship. Now I'm wrapping up. I think my points are clear. Participation in environmental issue, urban environmental issue is high, deeply connected to political, social, and cultural concerns. And we need to pay more attention to these aspects when thinking about citizen engagement in promoting biodiversity. Cities make a difference. Different cities foster different justifications and motivations and rights makes uh, all this uh, model uh, um, politically hybrid. And now I'm concluding to, uh, that we all hold on to the misleading intuition that when we're in the city, we're no longer in nature. And this is of course wrong in all ways. Um, what I'm suggesting is that the city is not just another platform for environmental activism and participation, but also the site that amplifies the political nature of environmental action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nir, for sharing the ecological citizenship model and the findings of your research showing how environmental action is connected to these broader social, economic, and political forces. So it is really great to be able to hear from multiple perspectives how biodiversity and cities offer pathways for diversity, conservation, equity, and well being and a different development model. So we have also received good questions in the Q&A that our panelists have been answering. So please keep posting your questions on the Q&A. And now to open the second part of this session, I would like to start with a question for John. So John, as you pointed out, most of urban growth in the next hundred years will happen in the global south. How does this affect biodiversity globally, since many of the rapidly growing cities are located near biodiversity hotspots? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. <clears throat> and there was a, a question in the question and answer window that I, ans that I answered with some similar thoughts that I'm gonna offer you now. Um, you know, I think one <clears throat> of the things that is <clears throat> actually near you, you, you were alluding to this, you know, one of the things that I think should be um, highlighted in international discussions is this, is this urban biodiversity connection. Um, I, I wrote into the Q&A that it's very clear that the IPCC um, has made that connection for, for, for quite some time. Uh, actually, since, um, since early days of the writing of the IPC of the of the reports um, from the IPCC, cities were um, were identified as really the, the essential to any climate solution. I think that has to be part of the way that the UN uh, Convention on Biological Diversity also thinks about cities. There the, there has to be a focus on uh, all of the all of the perspectives that we've heard about in this all of the very diverse perspective we've heard heard about in this panel uh, bringing bringing people in to discuss how is this paradigm shift from cities that have always been seen as urban economies solely as engines for production and that and you know no surprise that that's what they are um, to places that have the potential to offer biodiversity niches, ecosystem, uh, homes for uh, diverse ecosystems, and actually contribute to, in the two ways that I mentioned during my presentation, both within the city borders, possibilities for biodiversity flourishing and even rewilding, and, um, and beyond their borders, uh, minimizing their draw on on resources, which to answer your question directly, is generally coming from the develop, developing regions of the world. So the wealthier and more successful a sustainable city is in Germany, 
the more likely it is drawing enormous amounts of products, uh, so materials and then processed materials um, to consume. And I'll just give one example. Sweden is a really uh, used as, as an example of a, a real success story in decoupling the growth of their economy from the material intensity. And this is very well established and it's true, they have decoupled um, when, you, when you simply um, account for the in-country production. But when you include all the products and services and systems that, that Swedish consumers uh, purchase, much of that is based on materials and production, energy consumption that's happening far from Sweden in the developing world. And when you actually account for that uh, material and energy intensity, you can't argue that the Swedish economy has decoupled from material intensity. So I think we have to be more honest about this relationship between the rich developed consumer-based North and really what is an, in many, many different ways, very clearly a one-way street on the delivery of resources from the developing world. Thank you, John. In my next question, I'm gonna move again to the city scale. And I would like to ask Wendy, how can wild cities help us cope with the global environmental challenges like climate change or other scenarios of disruptive change, such as the current pandemic? And what are ways to ensure that those benefits materialize for the most vulnerable populations, both human and non-human? Mm. Thank you, Marcella. The, the wild city has to be seen as a provocation. So it, what it's asking us to do is to fundamentally think about human nature relationships and, and how that has evolved uh, over time and how it needs to change as we move into the future. So the history of cities has sought to expel nature from this urban growth machine. Um, and, and, and we're now realizing uh, in the Anthropocene that that, that, that that is unsustainable. So we've seen this uh, attempts to bring nature in a way uh, at various scales back into the city, um, some in a very gentrified mode and some in a very sincere mode as some of the examples that we've seen from the panel today. But, but what lies underneath this is actually a, 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 a fundamental understanding of, of, of our place within a broader uh, system of biodiversity. And that's really what needs to shift. Otherwise, we're going to see some very superficial uh, tokenistic approaches to greening the city. Um, also, the idea of wild needs to be interrogated. So, you know, uh, Manuel Castells talks about the wild city, but he doesn't talk about wild as in nature. What he's talking about there are processes of politics, of urbanization, of what happens when community groups and social movements fail. So his notion of the wild city is not the same as, as the rewilding movement, which is seeing to, you know, bring nature back into the city. Uh, so when people are talking about wild, they're talking about quite different aspects and, and making that conversation more transparent and more visible um, so that everyone can speak to the same page is really important. We've seen this with resilience. Resilient cities uh, can be any number of things, but some of the most uh, conservative and damaging uh, groups in history have been incredibly resilient. So it's not necessarily that resilience is always a good. Um, it's what kind of resilience for who? Who is this resilience serving? How does it look? And it's the same with wild cities. What are we talking about when we speak about wild cities? And I really appreciated the panel today because what was clear is that wild cities must sit alongside uh, the idea of the right to the city. Um, how do we shape cities to our heart's desire? How does that include non-human species? How does that, how do we extend this sort of, you know, arrogance of, 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 of human centeredness to embrace a more than human world? So these are some of the questions uh, that we need to ask, as well as some fundamental questions. Why do we behave so destructively in the first place? Um, what does it mean to be wild in the 21st century? How can we shift our concept of civilization away from damage and dispossession uh, towards something that is more regenerative and reconstructive, more reconsidered? And if we live in the midst of a climate emergency, what can we do to shape that? 
So my anxiety about the uh, COVID context and um, amidst all of the destruction that COVID has caused, there has been um, some recognition that perhaps there have been some gains in environmental terms. Uh, you know, there are lots of uh, reflections on, you know, without the amount of air traffic, we're seeing the rivers come back to a, a certain level of quality in Venice, for example, and, and other examples such as this. But again, who has the right to pause? Who has been able to benefit within this COVID context? And if we don't pay attention to the range of you know, human and non-human experiences and think carefully about what this is beyond just a gentrified greening the city agenda, uh, then I think we're not really going to attend to the, the issues that are fundamentally at the heart of what Nia was talking about with, you know, ecological citizenship or what Lorena was talking about in terms of questions of, you know, social and ecological justice. In fact, everyone in the panel um, was reflecting on these contested but entangled issues. Thank you, Wendy. I would now like to give you the word, Felipe, to expand a little bit on the recovery and how can biodiversity help particularly Latin American cities recover from the pandemic? Okay, Marcela. Um, uh, this is a, a, um, an important question um, more in this moment. So uh, I'm going to start with one example that we uh, vivid in, in the pandemic is when, uh, especially in this, in this uh, local uh, farmer, it's a uh, one species, the, the Moringa, Moringa Oleguera is, is the name of the species. Uh, was something really interesting because uh, um, a case in one jail in a, in another city in Colombia uh, create a, a gossip about, about the the possibility to use Moringa to uh, recover from COVID. So and it was something incredible because it increased the demand of the Moringa in uh, incredible numbers, the price of the Moringa increased exponentially. So it, it was really interesting to see how, how, how the people react over a news uh, related with, with one species. And that is something that for us uh, create the possibility to start to see, okay, natural capital in the case of uh, Latin America is, is our asset, the natural capital. So. And we have incredible, in Colombia, incredible numbers, as you see in biodiversity, useful plants, is something is amazing. And in, in our research in, in, in the local farm, we have the possibility to see how just one plant has the possibility to be a hinge between the rural areas and the urban areas, and the possibility to develop, expand uh, through innovation, many value change, it's, it's something amazing. And is for us something as a possibility to use the concern uh, in this moment from the people in the cities about health. The people are more, more, more focused in, okay, what are the possibility to use herbal teas or to use a species uh, in the uh, gastronomy, for instance, as, as something as to uh, strong our defenses. So, it is something that is a movement. So it's something that I think that uh, has the possibility to increase in the, in the pandemic. And um, we have seen this as a possibility to work in a, a sophistication of the value chains, okay? It's what is the possibility to, to use innovation through the value chains, not only in the final products, but also in the, in the market, in the strategy of communication. So, Many things around are possibilities to sophisticate the, the value change. And we have seen the interest of many companies in this moment. Uh, I, have, uh, I have meetings every week with different companies interested in innovation with useful plans, for instance. So in, and in the different uh, uh, possibilities of use, uh, food, cosmetic, uh, phytotherapeutics, uh, many things. I think that is something that uh, is a, a great possibility in the post-COVID scenario to recover economy. Um, and I think that is a reality now. Thank you, Felipe. Now, Lorena, I would like to expand on a point you made earlier and ask what are some of the tensions and the regulatory contradictions that arise in informal settlements, just to use a word, regarding the use of land for green public spaces and urban wilds? 
And what are some policy or land use planning recommendations to address these issues? Thank you, Marcela. Well, that's that's a very tricky question. And I think actually kind of in a nutshell, representing the big question we have, right? Uh, the one of the of the big questions we have and how we reconcile um, actually our you know uh, human um, presence in the planet uh, as part of life in general um, and that of course and and that means that several things but uh, not just seen as as part of that uh, broader um, ecosystem uh, and that we need to take care of that otherwise there is no human life possible but other that also that we need to take care of social justice issues and i think that's for me that's one of the key um challenges we have right now how we approach those agendas uh we know that those are the two crucial issues right now, mobilizing people all over the planet, and in particular youth, uh, young people from different backgrounds and different cultures. So the climate, you know, the climate strike and the social justice uh, strike with uh, indigenous people, um, um, black communities all over the place, and people disenfranchised, you know, racialized communities in, in different places. So I think that's part of the big question. And part of the problem is that uh, I think there are two two main problems, probably. Uh, one is um, the fragmentation and the sectorization that we have in, you know, in, in knowledge, knowledge production and how the, how the government and public institutions are actually organized and, and therefore how we conceive regulations. Uh, so this concrete example for example, in, in Mexico City um, that I'm sure you can you can see in other places too. If you look at the, you know green regulation uh, and in particular what they call the green uh, plan verde, the green plan for the city, uh, of course regarding conservation areas etc. for the for the city itself, and then the planning and the housing and the urban development planning uh, regulation, they are totally contradictory, right? But when when you look at the territory, they're trying to deal with the same place. <laughs> And in many of those places, actually, there are so-called informal settlements. And again, because the rest of the city is already, you know, gentrified, it's, it's very expensive, there are no place to go, and so on and so forth. So I think those are some of the tensions we have and overcoming those sectorial approaches and very specialized approaches uh, if we want to reconnect these issues. And finally, I think at the, at the core of these, uh, of course, land. Uh, and land and territory and land um, and territory, not just as the surface and not just as earth, but everything that is connected to that. And of course, as, as the basis for sustaining life. And, and if we think about two crucial um, topics that will connect cities with, with biodiversity that way, um, one is food production uh, and the other one is building materials. So that's why I'm insisting on those topics because uh, if we if we follow those things and, and we analyze how our cities are built and what kind of consumption we, we are having of those two things uh, is um, probably driving most of the destruction and, and very um, you know um, problematic patterns that we have of habiting and, and consuming and producing in, in, in our city. So just to think about that, of course, there are many other elements, but I think we need to find some key entry points and some key uh, topics that we will shift uh, and then they will have a, a bigger uh, repercussion um, in, in, in how our societies really, because our urban societies right now are, are functioning. So I hope that was clear. Sorry, my English is a bit uh, unclear today. <laughs> Thank you, Lorena. Your English is very clear today. So my final, final question goes to Nir and goes back to the concept of ecological citizenship. Nir, can you offer some thoughts on how urban citizenship versus national citizenship offers pathways to increase citizens' engagement in environmental action, considering the rising power in national and global politics of cities? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I want to answer this in two ways. And the first is personal. Uh, as you know, as I, as I said, I'm from uh, Israel in the midst of an ethno-national uh, uh, conflict, and I'm part of a coalition trying to build uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian solidarities, uh, uh, cooperation around environmental initiatives, and what we find so far is that working through state institutions 
is not very successful due to this ethno-national uh, conflict. However, when we start working at the municipal level between neighboring cities, cities that are, are part of the, a similar uh, bioregion, mutual goals uh, could be met. And again, as I mentioned before, these goals are environmental and political at the same time. It's quite difficult uh, uh, swimming against the, 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 the stream, but uh, you know you, you do what you can and operate through the mechanisms that uh, are functional and effective. And uh, the municipal has proved itself to be much more effective uh, in these kinds of, uh, or is I hope will prove itself to be more effective in these types of uh, uh, situation, which are not unique only for Israel. Uh, now, let's take a step out and I will say that cities are now global actors. They are uh, playing untraditional roles. I mean, if you open the textbook of urban politics, you would not see cities engaged in uh, uh, global diplomacy. Uh, so I'm thinking about supranational networks like uh, ECLE, founded in uh, 1990, the uh, um, Local Agenda 21, uh, um, UCLG, more forcefully uh, C40 and the Global Covenant of, of, uh, of Mayors, which more or less declared, we will no longer wait for nation states to achieve global climate agreement. And where states fail, we will step in. For those who follow the political architecture of the Paris Climate Accord, for example, cities were pushing their nation states into consent. And the most amazing thing is that uh, this did not rise bottom up, but cities united into these uh, supranational networks that gained so much power that they actually managed to uh, uh, force their preferences on states from the top down. Uh, so all this is to say that now we expect much more of our cities. And as I hinted, we should start thinking uh, about cities as semi-autonomous polities and to recognize cities as fertile grounds for profound uh, engagement in environmental action that is not just parochial, but operates effectively on a global scale. I'll say this explicitly through our urban citizenships, maybe we can work to achieve universal or global cosmopolitan goals, even if we understand these goals uh, or uh, ascribe different meanings. Uh, to them. But there always has to be a but, right? Uh, I don't think we should uh, downplay the role of the state. There is a discrepancy between the planetary reach or urban metabolism, as John uh, showed us in his uh, presentation, and the effective policymaking capacities of municipal governments. Now, while uh, cities and civic engagement can effectively reduce carbon emissions or rewild uh, cities, as uh, Wendy was uh, suggesting, or divest uh, from fossil fuels or transition into more uh, sustainable uh, development schemes, structurally, cities lack the capacity to legislate and regulate uh, resource extraction, industrial policies, uh, uh, labor laws, uh, for example, and all the other necessary factors for effective climate policy or for protecting biodiversity in uh, non-urban uh, areas. So, I'm not romanticizing that we should build only on cities. Cities can also be a place of places of despotism, not only democracy. It's not only a, a, a about citizenship. It's many times struggle against the municipality, as I'm sure Lorena can uh, talk more, uh, much more to this point, uh, uh, thinking about this from the right city perspective. Um, so I don't think we should place too much uh, impossible burdens on uh, cities because that would unwarrantedly dissolve our nation states from their uh, responsibilities. So maybe the most effective way to think about this dynamic given cities new role as global actors is not in a zero sum fashion as cities versus states, but rather as a new division of labor between urban and national citizenships. Well, thank you so much, Nir. And um, we're getting close to the end. I am very inspired by the discussion today. And thank you to the audience for your questions and to our panelists for your thoughtful perspectives and contributions today. So thank you to our partners, the Humboldt Institute and the MIT Sloan Latin American office, again, for helping us organize this event. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Tomorrow's session is going to be focused on case studies and examples from the Global South, 
where again cities are growing at an accelerated rate and in close proximity to biodiversity hotspots. You can use the same link that you used for the session today. We hope to see you again tomorrow and thank you for being here with us today.